Hi guys, welcome back to Codemaster Coach, your medical coding tutor. In today's video, we are wrapping up chapter one of your code books, Certain Infectious and Parasitic Diseases. Uh, we've already covered AIDS and we've already covered, um, if you look at your guidelines at the beginning of your code book, it starts off with certain infectious and parasitic diseases, human immunodeficiency virus. So we've already covered AIDS. Um, and today we're going to go into sepsis. All right. So, but before I start, I want to also say that in chapter one, you have a late effect for um, infectious and parasitic diseases because remember, patients today can suffer residual effects of diseases or infections that they had before. So chapter one provides four sequela. Remember we talked about sequela in a previous video. Chapter one provides four sequela categories for use when there is a residual condition due to previous infection or parasitic infestations. B90, which is sequela of tuberculosis. B91, sequela of poliomyelitis. B92, sequela of leprosy. And B94, sequela of other and unspecified infectious and parasitic diseases. So we've got that out of the way. We do have late effect codes that identify sequela or residual effects that the patient could have today as a result of a previous parasitic or infectious disease process. So let's talk sepsis. Sepsis. What I had to do is remember in a previous video I asked you to apply yourselves. Apply yourselves as you're studying this coding. And, and another um, tidbit that I want to give you is when you start coding for a facility, you'll learn their language. And when I started working in different organizations, when I got to one particular one, I learned my physicians and I learned how they diagnose patients. Where um, one facility might call it gastritis, another might call it gastroenteritis, another might just call it abdominal pain. So it, they're all pretty much the same diagnoses, but the language at certain facilities tends to be a language. You had to learn the way that I talk um, in order to follow me. I don't know, some people say I talk fast, some people say I don't. So just like you had to learn my language and how I talk, you'll learn your physicians and how they diagnose their patients. Well, if you ever come across a diagnosis that, that is new to you today, what I tend to do is I'll find a scrap piece of paper and I'll write down um, sepsis or severe sepsis or septic shock, which are three areas I'm getting ready to cover. Because if I don't feel like I'm familiar enough with it, what I want to do is at the end of day to day or when I have some downtime, I want to go in and research it, pull out my medical dictionaries or Google those terms and try to learn as much as I can about it because as I learn the disease process, I can better code it. Okay, so I'm taking the extra steps to apply so that I can better code my circumstances. So when it comes to sepsis, of course, I went in and I Googled what is sepsis. I looked up in my medical dictionary. I got a Dorland's and a Tabor's and I tried to find out what is sepsis. I know that sepsis can lead to severe sepsis, which then can lead to septic shock. So when it comes to sepsis, first of all, the patient has an increased temperature above 101 or the opposite it goes below 96.8 because think about it with sepsis what happens that patient usually a very young child or a very older patient and their immune system is compromised or any other patient that has immune um, system compromised due to other disease process they tend to become septic or run the chance of getting sepsis and what's happening is they can start off with a very minor infection that if goes untreated for a longer period of time it tends to creep in and what happens your body's immune system is trying to kick in and cure that infection is trying to take care of it but because it's pulling and trying to take care of it it weakens or causes organ dysfunction of other body systems. So what was a minor urinary tract infection can then become 
such a big infection throughout the body or a di disease process, it can be just that much wear and tear on your body to cause other organ dysfunction that it very well could kill you. So when I think of sepsis, severe sepsis and septic shock, that patient's immune system is trying its best to fight, but because it's pulling so much, it's deteriorating that patient's body. Most of us, if our immune system is, is strong and we keep ourselves up, we can fight off. Have you ever, and I think about um, resistance, methicillin, they call it MRSA, where um, even when they try to treat a patient with an antibiotic, your body becomes so used to that antibiotic that it doesn't even help. Your body becomes resistant to it. Well, I think about that when it comes to disease process, how we're so quick to pull out an antibiotic, we don't finish it. We're supposed to take it for 10 days. After five days, we're feeling better and we stop. Well, we've got some extra penicillin in the closet if another cold comes on, right? Or another sore throat or whatever. We start taking that antibiotic and it seems like it's getting better for a couple of days, but then it comes back, whatever was going on with you comes back and it comes back threefold. What happens, your body's built an immunity to that um, antibiotic that you were taking. And so now you need something even stronger. Well, I think about that when I think about sepsis, how your body is kicking in and it's trying to fight and it's trying its best to fight, but it just cannot. Doctors have to get in and try to get ahead of that disease process and help fight, help your body fight the disease process. So what is sepsis? Again, I said your temperature usually increases above 101 or decreases below 96.8 because your body's not able to kick in and build up its immunity. Um, your heart rate is higher than 90 beats per minute or your respiratory rate is higher than 20 beats per minute. So your body is kicking in, it's fighting. I think of a little child, a baby. When a baby has a fever, have you ever noticed their breathing is they start panting <laughs> faster than normal? Okay, so when I'm looking at sepsis, what started off as maybe a urinary tract infection now is becoming other stuff. Their temperature is rising. Their heart rate is increasing. Their breathing is increasing. Well, when it becomes severe sepsis, in addition to the increased temperature or decreased temperature, increased heart rate or respiratory rate, on top of that, they have decreased urine output. Now their body's not able to uh, pull out the fluids and, and allow you to excrete them. Abrupt change in mental status. A lot of times with your elderly patients, they'll come in with a, mental, um, a change in mental status. And I used to wonder why they would do check the patient's urine. Well, a lot of times that would help them know that this patient had a UTI that has now gotten into their system and, and a whole lot more is going on. So they do have a change in mental status, decreased platelet count, difficulty breathing, an abnormal heart pumping and abdominal pain. Guys, these are the stuff I just picked off picked up out of my medical dictionary and from Googling, just trying to understand exactly what is going on with sepsis. What is sepsis versus severe sepsis? And then septic shock, in addition to what you had with sepsis and severe sepsis, septic shock gets to a point where you have an extremely low blood pressure that cannot be relieved with simple fluid replacement. So now they're trying to step in and give you your body back the fluid replacement that it needs because it is, you're actually having organ dysfunction. And now the, the physicians are trying to step in and give you fluid, trying to build you back up, and that's not even doing good. You're in septic shock. You're on your way out. So how do I, as a coder, code all this? Well, for a diagnosis of sepsis, the appropriate code for the underlying systemic infection should be assigned first. So what started all of this? What caused it? Was it UTI? If that's the case, I code that first. Then streptococcal sepsis is classified to category A40 with a third character specifying sepsis due to different streptococcal strains. Now, if the type of infection or causal organism is not further specified, then I'd assign code A41.9 
sepsis unspecified organism. So you see what we're doing? We're, we're identifying first what systemic infection caused this patient to go into sepsis. Then I assign my sepsis code and then I also identif identify the causal agent or organism, streptococcal, staphylococcal, etc. So what is bacteremia? Now bacteremia, which is code R78.81, refers to the presence of bacteria okay, in your bloodstream. And that's usually after trauma or mild infection. So let's not mix up sepsis and bacteremia. Bacteremia is when your blood shows proof of the organism in it. Okay. Now in a systemic inflammatory response, SIRS refers to the systemic response to infection. That means your body's kicking in. What is your body's response? And this can even happen with trauma, burns, or other insults to your systems, including fever, tachycardia, tachypnea, lack of oxygen, um, leukocytosis, and other non-infectious origin. And those are coded to R65.1. And it depends on whether acute organ dysfunction is present. If it is, R65.11. And if other organ is um, not present, then R65.10. Severe sepsis, R65.2, generally refers to sepsis with associated acute or multiple organ dysfunction. So understand, when it gets to severe sepsis, not only do you just have one organ, you've got organ dysfunction, and it could be multiple organs. In addition to your bladder dysfunctioning, it can spread. You can have other types of dysfunctions. So septic shock generally refers to a circulatory failure associated with severe sepsis and therefore represents a type of organ dysfunction. So the coding of severe sepsis requires a minimum of two codes. Sequence first, the code for the underlying infection, followed by a code from subcategory R65.2 for the severe sepsis. Now, if the causal organism is not documented, remember I said use A41.9, unspecified, sepsis unspecified organism for the infection. An additional code should also be assigned for the associated, if there's acute organ dysfunction, identify that as well in your, in your coding. Now, if severe sepsis is present on admission, assign first the code for the underlying systemic infection, followed by the appropriate code from subcategory R65.2, as required for your sequencing rules in your tablet list. It'll tell you that in your code book. And a code from subcategory R65.2 can never be assigned as the principal diagnosis. Because again, we're saying that this is a result, sepsis is a result of a previous infection, trauma, burn, some type of effect on your body, on your system, and your body's trying to kick in and fight it, but because your immune system is compromised, it's not able to. So again, sepsis is the result of, therefore you have to identify it's a result of what? First you had this systemic infection, now it's led to sepsis or severe sepsis or septic shock. So R65.2 can never, sepsis can never be your principal diagnosis because it's a result of. All right, so I hope I made sense with that. And then also I wanna put in your ear what's called nosocomial infection. I can remember when I first got to a hospital and I wonder why infection control was so concerned about nosocomial infections. Nosocomial infections, which is category one, uh, Y95, are secondary infections that are contacted as a result of medical treatment or they develop during hospitalization. They can also be referred to as hospital acquired infection. And so remember to also assign an additional external code, external cause of morbidity code to identify these infections. And all that means is when in, you came in with one infection, say pneumonia, and because of the treatment that your physician rendered you, now you have something else. Well, that's not right. Or you came into the hospital with pneumonia and other patients in the hospital have this other infection going on and you pick it up. So nosocomial 
when our infection control um, director was tracking nosocomial infections, I understand why now because these are infections that the patient got as a result of care that was rendered. Therefore, it's not the patient's fault. It's something the facility or the physician did that caused the patient to have this type of infection. Okay, guys, this has been a big chapter on chapter one. And um, it's considered volume six in my lesson plans that I prepare for you. And I, I was warning you that these lesson plans will get longer and harder. And let, volume six has 40 exercises for you to complete. So if you're wanting to request a lesson plan that is a transcript of this video, it restates the coding guideline and it gives you exercises based on these coding guidelines for you to complete. And I also include an answer key that gives you the answers that you can refer to after completing the exercises. Because a lot of times you want that answer immediately and waiting for me to reply to an email can take a long time sometimes. Or when you're in the mood and you're doing your exercise, you want an answer right now. Well, I've included an answer key in there as well. So again, email me at codemastercoach at gmail.com and ask for volume six. Volume six will be all of my, my two previous videos on infectious and parasitic diseases and AIDS and now sepsis and severe sepsis and shock. I just kind of combined them all in one lesson plan and it's volume six. So if you want to email me at Codemaster Coach and let me know that you'd like for me to send you the link to that lesson plan. Okay guys, that's it. Any other questions, be sure to email me, let me know and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks guys.